Well, hello everyone. This is Daniel. Here, I just wanted to show you what I got here on my YouTube channel. This is my channel, so... Um, going through a lot of these, there's, uh, there's a lot of good ones that I really enjoy, especially the ones that we've... You know, we got a Christmas parade thing here. And they had some, well this one here, we went to Westernly Christmas Express, we went on a train, that was kind of cool. Now my favorite video on here, I know, let's see if I can go through and find it, yeah, so I make these in in many parts because this program I use um, only allows a certain amount of words at a time so I can't like make one whole video I wish I could but I know that making shorter videos I think people tend to watch more than just um, say something like this one 10 minutes this one's a 10 minute video here. I do just kind of want to go over and uh, sh and play some of these for you. I know we've I know you've seen them before, but I mean, at least I can play some of my favorite videos on here and just kind of make a one whole video on the on these uh, series. So, let's see. Imagine selling ice to Eskimos. Now, meet Danny, the refrigerator salesman in the desert. This ambitious entrepreneur hailed from Los Angeles, and one fine day in May 1931, he wandered into the Boulder City construction. Now, the desert is known for its surprises. Snakes, scorpions, sandstorms, you name it. But a refrigerator salesman, all decked out in a blue suit and shiny wingtips appearing out of nowhere, that was a new one even for the seasoned desert dwellers. But Danny was no illusion. He had sniffed out the opportunity in the new town rising from the desert. Sure, refrigerators were a hot commodity in the sweltering heat, but Danny's timing was off. The town was still under construction, lacking running water, reliable electricity, and there were just a few homes standing. He was all in, ready to make his mark, regardless of the odds against him. Battle lines drawn, the city slicker, and the desert rats entered one of the sweltering temporary bunkhouses. The air was thick with suspicion as Danny, our refrigerator salesman, tried to blend in with the hardened construction workers. His gleaming wingtips reflected the scant desert light, making him stick out like a cactus in a snowstorm. Meanwhile, the workers, their faces etched with desert grit and determination, sized up Danny. They saw in him a smooth operator from the City of Angels, a man who had crossed the desert sands not for camaraderie, but to sell them something they couldn't use, a refrigerator in the desert. The tension was palpable, the kind that could make even a rattlesnake sweat. In the midst of this, an idea sparked, a poker game, a face-off between the city slicker and the desert rats, a chance to settle the score. With stakes high and tensions higher, Danny and the construction workers sat down to play a game of poker. What happens next? Stay tuned. Follow and hit that subscribe button for part two. So here's part two. Gather around, folks, and let me tell you about Danny, the city-bred salesman and his first encounter with the field engineers. Picture this. A dimly lit bunkhouse, a card game underway, so my eyes and a tension so thick you can cut it with a knife. For some At one reason. end sits our hero, Danny, dressed to the nines, sweating bullets, but refusing to lose his cool. Opposite him, three gruff engineers, their grimy hands dealing cards with a devilish grin. The game rages on, each hand more intense than the last. Just when the suspense is about to peak, Danny drops a bombshell. He needs to use the outhouse. The engineers, seeing an opportunity to rattle Danny, warn him about the desert's infamous scorpions. <laughs> you can see the hesitation in Danny's part. eyes, but he's not one to back down. 
Bold as ever, Danny, though hesitant, decides to brave it out into the dark desert. So, Danny, our city-bred salesman, ventures into the pitch-black desert, heading towards the outhouse. With each hesitant step, he can feel the desert's grit beneath his polished shoes. The stars above seem to twinkle mischievously, as if sharing a secret joke with the scorpions lurking in the shadows. The outhouse, a lonely structure in the vast darkness, looms ahead, a beacon of necessity in the desolate night. Fear of the unknown, or rather the unseen, grips Danny. Images of scorpions, as suggested by the field engineers, play on a loop in his mind. The desert, with its heat and dust, he could manage. But the thought of a scorpion sting on his most vulnerable of places, that's a different story. As he reaches his destination, he takes a deep breath, preparing himself to face the unseen enemy lurking in the dark. His hand trembles as he reaches into his pocket and pulls out a match. The striking of the match against its box is loud in the hush of the desert, the flare of light momentarily blinding him. As the glow settles, Danny, with renewed courage, peers intensely at the toilet seat, scrutinizing every inch for the dreaded arachnids. <laughs> Satisfied with his inspection, he recklessly flicks the still-burning match into the outhouse hole. And then the desert night is no longer quiet or dark. A sudden flash lights up the sky, followed by a resounding boom that echoes across the barren landscape. The outhouse, once a simple structure of necessity, now stands engulfed in flames, a blazing monument to Danny's city-bred ignorance. And our dear Danny, well, there he goes, running off into the night with his smoldering pants around his ankles, leaving behind a flaming outhouse and a group of engineers in absolute disbelief. <laughs> the desert, once a silent witness to the night's events, now echoes with their laughter, a fitting soundtrack to this explosive tale. Well, folks, that's one way to leave an impression. As the dust settled, the engineers gaped at the flaming outhouse, then at the sight of Danny, his trousers ablaze, darting away into the desert night. Their chuckles echoed under the starlit sky, punctuated by the occasional sizzle from the smoldering ruins. This unforgettable night turned into a tale as legendary as the Hoover Dam itself, recounted with roaring laughter and a shake of the head. So, remember when life gets tough? Just be thankful you're not Danny running into the desert night with smoldering pants and a burnt ego. <laughs> Let's head back to your channel. Ever wondered? Let's see. Well, videos. Of course. Let's see. So actually, let's go through these. No, oh, yeah, I think most people love these videos. Actually, very immerse good. yourself in the grueling reality of dam construction. Visualize a barren landscape, scorching sun glaring overhead. Exhausted laborers persist, battling the heat. Suddenly, a worker succumbs to heat stroke. His peers can only watch in horror or rush him to a makeshift camp where ice water is the only immediate help. Witness accounts like those from mess hall worker Victor Castle tell harrowing tales of men collapsing with no doctor on site. Those reaching Las Vegas Hospital are treated with ice packs and heart stimulants, but often, arriving with body temperatures as high as 112 degrees signifies little chance for survival. John Gick, another worker, paints a grim picture of the victims, dead, bloated, and looking like they had been parboiled. To grasp the stark human toll, consider this. Between June and July 1931, 14 lives were lost to heat prostration. That's one life lost every two days. A sobering reminder of the human cost of progress. Immerse yourself in the... Gr Picture this. It's the depth of night in Boulder City, as J.N. Smith clocks out from his swing shift at the Hoover Dam. Tired and disoriented, he wanders down a silent, sandy street, counting off eight houses before he finds what he believes is his humble abode. He raps on the door, calling out for entry, only to be met with the business end of a double-barreled shotgun. A stern warning sends Smith tumbling off the porch and sprinting up the street, 
heart pounding in his chest. It's only when he stops to catch his breath that he spots his true home. An entire row of houses had been built since his last trip home the night before. This is evidence to the rapid development of Boulder City and a tale of one man's unexpected American adventure. Don't forget to subscribe to Master Cactus Emerald for more captivating stories. Picture this. Unraveling the tragic tale of the Hoover Dam, where approximately 96 lives were lost during its construction. A persistent question. How many bodies are encased in the concrete? Answers vary, but consensus leans towards half of the casualties. Yet. So... This one, more specifically, we always say that as tour guides. How many, how many bodies are in case? We say about half of that, which don't know what it means. I know some guides use it, but excuse me. Um, but in this uh, video, tell you specifically why it would be literally impossible to bury someone with just about three inches of concrete at a time, really. I mean, that's how much the buckets released after each bore. Let's this continue. is largely regarded as a damn myth. You see, the concrete was poured in specific batches with each layer being a few inches thick. Any trapped worker would create an air pocket, which the crew would eliminate by vibrating the concrete. Our focus today is on a worker who met an untimely end due to a failed wooden structure. Wet concrete, collapsing, swept him down to the dam's base, and large rocks within the mix ended his life instantly. The construction as efforts to retrieve his body from the concrete lasted over half a day. Thank you for tuning in. I'll be back next week with more captivating stories. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Unravel. Imagine a crisp fall day in September 1931. High scaler Jack Russell begins his perilous work on the Arizona rim of the emerging Hoover Dam, jackhammer in hand. High above, a sling full of drill steel is being lowered. Suddenly, without warning, a glittering bar slips free, hurtling downward. The frantic shouts of warning echo across the canyon, but it's too late for Russell. Struck flush on the head, he falls a chilling 400 feet to the riverbank below. The sight is gut-wrenching, a grisly tableau of blood and torn flesh scattered over jagged rock. But the horror doesn't end there. Due to local law, Russell's remains cannot be moved until the county coroner arrives. Six long hours pass before he arrives from Kingman, 65 miles away. All the while, the workers must navigate around the blood-stained sheets and buzzing flies, a chilling reminder of the day's tragic events, a stark reminder of the harsh realities faced during the construction of this American marvel. Imagine... Picture this. A chilly afternoon in late January 1932, Superintendent Price and his crew are hard at work on the Colorado River, reinforcing a critical trestle with a flat car mounted pile driver. Each pile driven, every cable strung, all in preparation for the impending spring floods. Confidence builds among the men. They're winning against the river's potential fury. But then, an interruption, the jarring ring of a telephone, a message relayed through a worker's panicked scream. Runaway train! Heading straight for them, right down the track. Suddenly, their confidence in the bridge's strength vanished. I almost Tune forgot about time, this hit one. Hit that subscribe button to find out what happens next in the Hoover Dam story. Picture this. Confidence in the bridge's strength vanishes. A pile driver sits in the middle of the span, teetering on the edge of disaster. Superintendent Tom Price and his men try to move it, but it won't budge. Desperation looms. An empty dump car is spotted several hundred feet from the Nevada end of the bridge. Time is ticking, but Price calculates they have a few precious minutes before the runaway train hits. The order is given. The men seize sledges, spikes, cables, anything they can grab, and sprint to the dump car. They swarm over it, fastening it to the track, hoping it can absorb the impact and spare the pile driver and the bridge. Tools dropped, they scatter into the desert, turning to watch the track, waiting. But the racing runaway doesn't show. Five minutes, ten minutes, and still nothing. We hope to see you again next time for part three. Please, if you... Picture this, a team of men in the heart of the desert, bracing for a tremendous collision. Tools drop, hearts pound, eyes fixate on the barren hill, awaiting the runaway train's inevitable appearance. But minutes pass and nothing. Confusion replaces anticipation. Then a small locomotive crests the hill, leisurely making its way down to the men. Far from a runaway, it's under full control. The locomotive halts before the barrier, revealing a crew from the gravel plant, including Red Allen. 
They disembark, surveying the solitary dump car entangled in a labyrinth of cables and spikes. Laughter bubbles up, breaking the tense silence. Pride, visibly flustered, demands, where's the runaway? Red Allen, fighting back a smirk, points to the dump car and retorts, right there. And from the looks of things, that's one that won't ever run away again. Thank you for watching. Please like the video so it can reach out to many others. Picture the Catch the wind of history as it breezes through the El Garces Hotel, an architectural marvel from 1908 in Needles, California. Named for Francisco Garces, the hotel overlooks the Colorado River, a symbol of past so exploration. This is a presentation Created from the a tour guide. And Fred Harvey Company, the hotel merges neoclassical Initials with A and grandeur. M. Known as the crown jewel of the Harvey chain, it's more than a hotel. It's a tribute to a storied past. From there, we travel to Arizona's south, where the Garcis National Forest resides, sprawling over 78,000 acres. Established in 1908, this natural wonder was formed from parts of Babaquivari, Tumacacori, and Huachuca National Forests. Today, it's part of the Coronado National Forest, a new chapter in the Garcis story. History isn't just about the past, it's about understanding our journey to the present. Keep exploring. Catch the wind of history. Emerging from the Mojave Desert over the Tehachapi Mountains, we find ourselves on the southern San Joaquin Valley floor, the future site of Bakersfield, California. This path, the Tejon Pass, was discovered by Francisco Garces in 1776. Garces, a name that echoes significantly in Bakersfield today. The city commemorates Garces with landmarks like the Garces Memorial High School and the Garces Memorial Circle, adorned with a statue of Garces. Journey to Las Vegas, Nevada, and you'll come across Garces Street. That's part of a sequence of streets named after renowned North American explorers. Finally, in Reno, Nevada, the St. Thomas Aquinas Cathedral houses splendid stained glass window, a tribute to this impactful personality. Garces's footprint extends far and wide, touching every corner of the American West. From the desert to the valley, Francisco Garces's legacy is forever etched into the landscape of the American West. Please come and follow for more of Garces' adventure part series. I hope to see you there. Good news and updates, folks. As of tonight, mark your calendars for January 28th, 2024. The Visitor Center is taking a breather. Yes, it's going off sale for a significant mm. stretch, but don't fret. Okay. Um, so anyone going to Hoover Dam is going to take a tour based off of any typical complication to like say elevator situations uh, we haven't had uh, well people were upset about this but we don't did, have not had uh, dam tours for a, a little bit because one of the elevators were out so when you come here um, before you do uh, check the website the uh, Bureau of Reclamation uh, website. They update everything on what tour is available because there's, there's a chance that you come and it, you may be lucky, maybe not, but uh, sometimes you, we just never know what's going to happen, especially when you want to get a tour. Uh, the power plants, well, most likely, I mean, we we do have to be open for power plants so um, uh, other than that we just shut down the place for for several days <laughs> if the elevators break down but other than that um, just make sure you check the the actual website don't go to any other ones um, the official website the Bureau of Reclamation website you want to see what's there Tickets for the power plant tour and the dam tour remain up for grabs. Now let's switch gears to our beloved museum. It's about to undergo a makeover, starting tomorrow, the day this video hits the airwaves. Exciting news on my commemorative coins. I'm snagging the first 50 off the press. They're not just cool, they're a conversation starter. After my tours, I love those post-tour chats with you all. And now... So yeah, those I'm going to be getting sometime around March... I think the 25th or something yeah so the main idea with those is uh, I will carry at least like 
some. I don't know how much some would be, I guess four or five. Um, because typically I can do up to around four or five, six tours a day. But, uh, of course, I can't give all of those coins to just everybody. I don't have enough. Um, although, yeah, they're really cool if I could uh, find, well, I'll show you later, but my channel profile, that's going to be on the back side. Uh, that's going to be the profile, and then my username will be on the bottom edge of it. It'll say Master Cactus on it. And then on the other side will be of the Hoover Dam and the bridge in front of it. So, um, so that's why, you know, whenever, you know, there are times where people want to, you know, they're going to say, oh, we really enjoyed the tour. They usually like to, you know, they like to step off to the side for a little bit after the tour, ask me questions and stuff. And and also to, like, people who n naturally want to give me a tip. Since we're federal tour guides, we can't accept tips. So, um, in return and for basically for uh, coming and enjoying my tour presentations, my tours I would actually give you the the commemorative coin this this uh, thing that I have um, so you can go right up to my channel. Even that you could just show it to whoever your friends and say oh this guy's got a YouTube channel this this coin his usernames right there so that's kind of the idea so like it makes it easier because I know people search for my username and they have to put a space after the first word but my channel has no spaces so it's gonna be master cactus together no spaces so I feel like sometimes when people, when I tell them that, they'll try to look for it and it's not there. But literally, if you just do it like that, it doesn't matter if you capitalize all the letters or if they're all lowercase. It will be the first. It will be the first channel to appear. So let's continue oh, here. With the coins embossed with my YouTube channel name, we've got even more to talk about. Remember, it's not just a tour, it's an experience. Stay tuned for more updates. Good news and update. Welcome to a fresh update on Hoover Dam Tours. Mark your calendars, as there's a new tweak in how the tour guides operate on the theater's main floor. You're now presented with two options, the power plant tour or the dam tour. Note, there's no standalone visitor center admission ticket anymore. Some visitors consider skipping the movie to jump straight into the tour. However, the next tour only commences once the movie wraps up. So why not soak up some... So yeah, everybody, um... That's another thing. So when you come here, do the tour, buy your tickets, you, your intentions are you immediately want to go straight on the tour. Well, waiting in line to get over to the other line, basically waiting, I would say anywhere from 20, 25 minutes and then you go on tour so then that tour is a half an hour so that's like almost an hour so and every time people come in we have to tell them okay need anyone need restrooms about 40 to 45 minutes not a single restroom in sight and and uh... all you're gonna see downstairs is running water that's all you're gonna see just a bunch of running water um, so that usually gives, gives the people that heads up, you know, they'll go and take care of their business, but, of course, when it comes to going in, we can only put in a certain amount of people at a time. 
the elevators can only hold up to 80. Well, excuse me, let me rephrase that again. Uh, each elevator can hold up to 40. So that's around 80 people on tour. So you might as well just stay and sit, watch the, the film, and then after the film, you go right on tour. Now, of course, let's just say you don't have enough time. I don't know how to help with that, uh, other than you could possibly skip the film to try to get into that other tour. But you won't be going on that other tour until five minutes um, after the first tour went down, because usually we'll have a overflow of people in line waiting for the tour, so right after the first tour goes down, it'll be five minutes until the next, but, there's a but, that will be useful only if we're full staffed, which some days we're not. If I could tell you exactly what days that would be, I don't know, because it changes and people call off, so I have no idea how to help you with that one. <laughs> so, just uh, plan ahead, prepare, know that this is what's going on. Cinematic knowledge during that wait. It's just a 10 minute film after all. Due to your overwhelming support, sharing, and liking my videos, it helps reach out to everyone, so continue liking and sharing. In other news, I've finally managed to purchase custom commemorative coins. I look forward to distributing them. It will have on the main side will be the dam and the bridge. The back side will have the image just like my profile. The text will have my channel name for which will make it easy for people to find. Stay tuned for their arrival and let's keep exploring together welcome to a fresh picture this the year is 1914 and a young Englishman named Gordon Kaufman steps onto Californian soil an architect with a flair for the Mediterranean revival style Kaufman quickly establishes his name his early works include the initial plan for Scripps College and several dormitories for the California Institute of Technology but it's not just Mediterranean charm he's known for as his career progresses, Kaufman becomes synonymous with the Art Deco style. His signature? Massively thick, streamlined concrete walls. His buildings, like the Los Angeles Times headquarters, take on a distinct mechanical appearance, resembling gigantic old-fashioned appliances. But his crown jewel? The Hoover Dam, a testament to his architectural genius. Gordon Kaufman, the architect who brought a unique style to life. Picture this. The year is 1940. In the heart of Black Canyon, the roar of man's resolve echoed as engineers and crews strived to tame the Colorado River. Four massive tunnels were hollowed into the canyon walls, each packed with dynamite and exploded. The ensuing debris was cleared swiftly, leaving a mountain of rubble. For two years, the canyon reverberated with daily blasts as fearless high high scalers prepared. In November 1932, a feat of engineering was accomplished. A once wild river diverted from its course. Dual temporary dams secured the foundation, which was pumped dry. Men and machines dug deep below the dried riverbed to reach for the dam's base. This process of excavation revealed the river's primeval bed, offering a sneak peek into our world's ancient geology. The exposed bedrock was conditioned for the first pour of concrete for the dam's base. For and whatever reason, I don't bare, remember this its video. It's read by geologists while workmen prepared the bedrock surfaces to receive the first concrete, ensuring the utmost stability for the Hoover Dam's foundation. In the heart of Black Canyon, the roar of man's oh, that must be the last one. engineers and crews struck. Okay, so, yeah, so, going back to what I was going to talk about, yeah, view my channel. Everyone. So this, yeah, one of the ways you can find my channel is right here. This is the cover, or the profile, this is the, um, whatever you call this, kind of like a secondary, like, landscape. Um, that's pretty much it. We got 38 videos. And so these are, let me see, let me pull up the recent videos. So these two are recent videos. This is just, um, 
basically fan-made or fan-fiction uh, videos. If you want to check those 